Hello, welcome back or welcome for the first time. If you're new here, I'm Ash and I make content about sewing and live action role play or combining the two. In a previous video based on an Instagram poll where you picked my character for me, I went thrifting for a character costume. Don't forget about that poll. That's going to be um, showing up again. Maybe not in this video, but very, very soon. So I've put together a capsule wardrobe for this one character, which you can see in my previous video. I've also talked a bit about how you you can go looking in your own wardrobe for clothes you can use to make a medieval or renaissance style fantasy costume for a lot, a round fair, your personal amusement, whatever works for you. But one thing we haven't really talked about is accessories and accessories are incredibly important. What accessories you pick and use can materially change the look and feel of your outfit, your character. You can wear the same costume six or seven times with different accessories and look fresh and new and exciting every single time. Also, they're smaller, cheaper and easier to pack. Let's talk about accessories. I'm going to start off talking through some different categories of accessories, but there are some categories of accessories that are so big, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up spending half the video just talking about a couple of those. Hello, this is the alternative intro, which I'm actually recording halfway through as it became very obvious I was not getting all of this recorded today. So it's going to be more than one video. This video we're going to cover a multitude of accessories, but not all of the accessories that there are. In a separate video, or videos, I don't know yet, we will be covering jewellery, scarves, and all the things you can do with them. Spoilers, you can wear a scarf on any part of your body, no one will stop you. And makeup and hair, body accessorising rather than object accessorising. I want to quickly preface this by saying that this video is intended for everyone regardless of their gender. Many accessories are extremely feminine coded and we don't need that kind of energy in LARP. All accessories are for everyone to use and if you're going to limit yourself to only appropriate accessories for your gender you are missing out on a load of really cool really fun stuff that you might not normally wear. I really want you to see LARP, Ren Fairs, other costumed activities as an opportunity to experiment with things that you might not normally try and that's why some bits of this video are going to be a little bit basic. Certainly I'm going to be assuming that, you know, not everyone knows what different kinds of jewellery or makeup are and how you wear them and what they do, but I'm still hoping that I'll be able to give pretty much anyone some new ideas and some new things to try that they maybe haven't thought of yet. However, in this first part of the video, we're going to go through some of the smaller categories head to toe. No, toe to head. That sounds good. So starting at the toe, shoes. No. If you are going to a LARP game or outdoor event, I cover shoes for those in my Intro to Field Kit video. If you are LARPing in a field, do not wear fashion shoes. <sighs> okay, I guess you might be going to like an indoor event or something. So on the assumption that you are indoors and can therefore wear fancy shoes, you might want to pick fancy shoes. I'll be completely honest and say that my go-to most of the time is not that exciting and it's a pair of knee-high black leather boots. I've got two different options here. These are the Ray boots from Pozu. They're a slightly more expensive option. I like these because they've got some fun detailing down the back and we are all about detail. Fundamentally, the main appeal of these boots for me is that they are very unobtrusive. They're comfortable, I can kind of run in them. They're not super supportive if I'm doing like difficult terrain or anything, but if I'm indoors and doing occasional outdoor stuff, then they're fine. My other main pair of knee-high boots, which is in really bad condition because I wore them a lot. These I got from a charity shop. I'm always on the lookout for low-heeled black knee-high boots. I've worn these for a lot of characters. They are in need of some TLC because I walk unevenly. Also broke the pull tab off the zip which makes them kind of difficult to put on and off. What I like about both of these is that they present a very unobtrusive silhouette especially if I'm wearing something like knee length or longer. If people notice them they look interesting and kind of appropriate but mostly they just disappear. The shoes are not the focal point of my outfit so if you just want some shoes that you can use for a lot of different costumes knee-high black leather boots great option. Another option I do end up using quite a lot and it is not the most cost-effective 
decorative. I have a lot of pairs of decorative boots. Obviously this is a lot more anachronistic, but if you're going for a more sort of playful air, a more punky modern feel isn't going to be jarring. Real Doc Martens are great, fake Doc Martens also exist in a wide variety of patterns, colours, you can normally get something that is either in the right colour scheme or thematically appropriate. But like I said, can get expensive. Not every game or event is going to embrace wearing floral patterned Doc Martens under your medieval gown. Your options then pretty much divide into uh, expensive or less expensive options. On less expensive options, charity shops are wonderful, but shoes are tricky to find because not only are you looking for a specific size, but also an uncommon style. There are two main styles that I think work really, really well that you do sometimes pick up. One is just a really straightforward black pump. Straps are big and clever. This is actually a pair of ballroom dancing shoes, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for an extremely plain, probably black. Brown is also fine. Ideally leather, doesn't have to be. Low-ish heel, this is about as high as I would go. Maybe a strap, not much else going on. These are among the easiest shoes to, again, just pass off as really unobtrusive. They are tricky to find in the first place. They're even trickier to find if you have, for example, larger feet, but they do exist. Specifically, if you want something exactly like this, you can often find secondhand dance shoes on, for example, eBay, and they're not ridiculously expensive. Another option to look out for in charity shops and other secondhand places is wedding shoes. Wedding shoes come in a bunch of different, often very classic styles, but one key thing about wedding shoes is they also tend to be white and dyeable. The dyeable is the magic word here. I have actually been wearing these sort of vaguely Victorian-esque wedding boots, as is for some time, and they're starting to get kind of mucky, so at some point I am going to dye these a different colour, and they can have a whole second lease of life. If you want a pair of shoes in exactly the colour of your outfit, or mm, close enough, dyeing shoes is not an exact science. Dyeing itself is chemistry and therefore cannot be trusted, but if you want to be in the right ballpark, your costume is not a common colour, like black or white, white or brown. Getting a pair of white shoes that you know you can dye and wedding shoes you generally can dye. Probably your best bet because they are one use footwear or limited use footwear. They do come up for sale secondhand pretty often. If you keep your eyes open, especially on secondhand websites, stuff will pop up. It will not be super cheap, but it will be cheaper than buying new. Then the kind of middle ground of expense, if you are already interested in fashion styles that come with interesting footwear. I'm looking at you goths and steampunks, or in my case, I wear a lot of the Lita fashion. The shoes are great. These shoes are not inexpensive. They tend to be more reasonably priced than Doc Martens or the historical shoes, which I'm about to talk about. They usually have some interesting details. If you want shoes with a lot of character, you want shoes that are going to stand out and be a feature of your outfit instead of just stuff for you to wear, Alternative fashion shoes is an okay place to start because you can end up with a lot of different interesting details. You can sometimes end up with a lot of different colours, less so for I know gothic shoes. Come to Lolita, we have colours. I say holding two black pairs. I have shoes in most colours that exist in my wardrobe, so I have a gold pair, a blue pair, a brown pair, a red pair, a white pair, these guys, another black pair. I have a lot of black shoes in general. I just wear a lot of black, you know. These are not going to be super hard wearing. That's your trade-off for cost and visual interest. On the subject of visual interest, so here you're having to deal with the fact that both of my pairs of American Duchess shoes are really old and ugly now. When I say really old, this is the OG Georgianas, like the first run. They have not held up great. People sometimes ask me how well do American Duchess shoes last, and I'm like, I can't tell you because these were the first shoes they ever made, and they are many years old now, and they're not holding up well. But I don't think it's fair to judge them based on this. I've also not been kind to them, you know? I've worn them to LARP events, which is not really what I think American Duchess had in mind. I know they always say, oh, people wear these to reenactments. LARP events are not reenactments. So I'm illustrating here with a couple of different American Duchess shoes, because these are the ones that I own. Again, have worn these to LARP events. They're very nice, they're very 
lovely, they're very beautiful. Ideally, what I would add to this selection is some sort of like medieval style turn shoe, or even just some more like Renaissance period shoes. You can get those. Upsides and downsides of these. Downsides, they're really expensive. Also, even though you were at an indoor event, you are still at a LARP event. Take it from me, you do not want to try and run away from monsters in leather soled shoes on parquet wooden floors. Consider getting non-slip soles fitted to your shoes if you're wearing them to a LARP event that has either combat or dancing. You are also, especially if you're going to be doing any kind of outdoor linear or combat activities, going well beyond the tolerances that these shoes were built to deal with, hence why I have basically destroyed these shoes. This isn't even mud, I just, I got these very, very wet repeatedly because that's what happens when you principally LARP over winter in England. Upsides, look at them, they're beautiful. If you want a historical or even just historically inspired pair of shoes, obvious choice, but even if it's strictly fantasy and you just want a beautiful pair of shoes, and they come in a lot of colors, if you've got the money to spend on them, historical shoes are a great shout, but money. So that's feet covered, we're now up to ankles and legs, so we're going to talk about hosiery. For the uninitiated, hosiery, which comes from the word hose, socks, tights, leggings, all that kind of thing. Where am I? Yeah. Yeah, those two. Cool. So depending on your costume, your socks or sock equivalents might not be that visible, or you might have to wear really practical boot socks and not see anything else. So this is definitely a section that you can skip if you don't want to, but it is an opportunity to have a lot of fun and introduce some color or detail or design. So let's start with what do you do if no one can see your socks, or maybe they could only see your socks a teeny tiny bit. Most of this video, and indeed most of the videos I produce will proceed upon the assumption that the main point of your costume is that other people will see it. That is not the only point of your costume. One other really important thing that your costume does is that you wear it. So there can be stuff on your costume that is not there for anyone else to see, it's there for you to know. Such as brightly colored socks. You can absolutely wear socks, under layers, very small bits of jewelry that no one will see or never see properly, but it's an important character detail or a funny in-joke or something Something that makes you think about this character in a particular way. You absolutely do not have to think about your socks, but if you would like to think about your socks and pick, I don't know, Veggie Tales socks for your pirate character, that's a thing you can do, and even if you're the only one who knows that they're there, you still know that they're there. If that's gonna happen, but also you think that people might see a little bit of your sock, particularly if you've got like formal shoes with trousers, and you're just going to get a little flash of sock every so often, a bright crew length sock with or without a pattern. You can either pick them based on color or you can pick them because they're thematic. That can just add a nice little pop and a little bit of like a classic menswear edge. On the other hand, you might have skirt, dress, robe, something that shows off quite a bit of leg. That's a lot of real estate, let's do something with that. You have a couple of options. Knee-high socks. Knee-high socks come in a pretty standard length, so depending on how tall you are and how wide your legs are, that might be below the knee, above the knee, halfway up your thigh, or nowhere close. Because I am both tall-ish and have large calves, they end up being exactly in the middle of my kneecap, which is not good. But anyway, longer socks are great if you don't want the full stockings or tights or you are wearing something short enough that you want the flash of skin at the top. More on that in a second. One thing I don't have here because I don't really wear them, you can go longer than knee-high socks, you can get thigh highs or stockings. Thigh highs usually stay up on their own, stockings you need a garter belt to hold them up because they are not elasticated at the top. Don't have a huge amount of experience with that, I'm aware that in, in the same way as all these other things you can get plain ones or you can get patterned ones, many options are available. I don't have a lot to offer on that front, I can just tell you that they exist. But that does bring me to to the full length option, which is of course 
tights. Tights cover you completely from toes to waist-ish. They have a built-in pants area. You've got some options when it comes to tights. Option number one, go into a regular store and buy tights. So you'll normally be able to get sheer tights in flesh colors or black. I'm gonna talk about these guys in a second. Fishnets, again, we're gonna talk about those in a second. And then if you're lucky, you'll get colored tights. And that's generally what you're looking for. Solid colored tights, if you just want your whole legs to be one solid color in a pretty skin tight way, this is what you want. And because they go all the way up to your waist, if you're comfortable wearing these as trousers, you can do that. No one will stop you. Maybe consider leggings instead, which are usually a bit thicker. These are extremely thin. If you want to wear just tights, I respect that. If you go online, you can normally find solid colored tights in an even wider variety of colors and also a wider variety of sizes. I have not tried them yet, but I'm led to believe that snag tights are pretty great. Almost everyone I know who's tried them has said very positive things about them and they come in a very wide range of sizes and a pretty wide selection of colors. Patterned fashion tights are comparatively rare. They do crop up from time to time. They tend to be kind of expensive, but you can sometimes get tights with patterns on them and same as the other socks. Pick them for the color, pick them because they're thematically appropriate. This pair is purple with like a vines pattern on it. So given that the costume Instagram made for me is purple and for an elf, I actually think I'm going to end up using these a lot. The Halloween section, which is very appropriate given that it is the time we're coming up to, will offer you a variety of interesting spooky tights. They are not designed to be long lasting. You have to be a bit gentle with them, but if you are, you can keep wearing them a bit longer. I got these blood spatter ones a few years ago and they're still going strong. They do also tend to be on the small side. And finally, as with the shoes, you can get alternative fashion options. These are from my Lolita wardrobe. These are very expensive, but also this is a pair of tights with a thigh high glitter design. I think that's worth the money. Next we have fishnets. Fishnets are full of holes. I've got two pairs of the same here. Regular fishnets, really big fishnets, sometimes get called fence nets. I don't think it really matters. They're all net. And then this pair I have Distress. Well, oh, that's another thing I didn't mention. You can cut holes in your tights, but they do ladder, which if you're going for like a distressed look, really, really good. I did this for a cyberpunk game and it's just worked out really useful to have a, a really distressed pair of fishnets around, you know? And then finally we have sheer tights or nude tights. The idea is you get these in as close to your skin tone as possible. You're not necessarily going to be picking these for accessories reasons, but you're going to be picking these for... This is like a real life filter. If I'm wearing just fishnets, because I don't shave my legs, I'm going to wear a pair of these underneath. Likewise, if you're wearing knee socks and you're not super confident about that gap between the top of the socks and the bottom of your skirt and the skin that's showing, you can layer knee socks on top of these kind of tights. If you decide to take a pair of Halloween tights and then really heavily distress them with lots of runs and rips and holes in them, and you don't want your skin showing through, you can layer them on top of a pair of these. Or if you have thigh highs that keep rolling down, you can get a pair of these, put them on, put the thigh highs on on top, pin the thigh highs to the tights, sew them, and then cut the rest of the sheer tight away. So you have sheer shorts attached to your thigh highs and now you have tights that looks like thigh high socks. I learned that from a cosplayer. The next part of the body up from your legs is your hands. Doesn't everybody's body work like that? Never mind. So let's talk about gloves and other hand shoes. As you can probably tell, I really like gloves. So what are your options when it comes to gloves? You've got kind of five main areas of gloves you're going to be dealing with. The first and the one you're going to run into the most often is just modern fashion gloves. And they're not bad. If you're going to get yourself one pair of gloves that you're going to use for a lot of different characters, get yourself a pair of just regular, normal leather gloves. Much like the knee-high leather boots, these are unobtrusive, unremarkable, in character enough. You can also use the touch screen on your phone, kinda, because they are skin. I've made it weird now, haven't I? But normal leather gloves that you can just find anywhere. Black is great, brown is also good, and you can 
could actually find a lot of variation in fashion gloves that are available. I've had these gloves for years and years. They're kind of a three quarter bracelet length unlined leather. I've had these so long, they are actually really, really stained. I find that as leather develops a patina as it gets older, it just becomes suitable for different costumes. Something to be aware of. Equally, when it comes to fashion gloves, you know, I found these, which are not leather, they are fabric with some leather detail. They need a little bit of TLC. Gloves are fragile, you will break them. Just accept now that you will break them and you have to repair them. But these gloves I also really like because they have a little bit more interest than just being regular leather gloves. Because they're not leather, they're not really warm in summer, they're just a little bit warm in summer. You also have the perennially popular driver's gloves, the ones that have the open backs, or sometimes they have string backs. Fun fact, the leather palm and then the string or open back is because it's hot, so you need to cool down, but you need the leather for the grit. That's why they're used for driving, horse riding, golf. I really like these. I think this pair just came from Primark. You can find gloves in fun colors. It's not always that likely. If you find a pair of gloves in the fun color, I always think grab them because who knows, they might work for a costume sometime. So that's modern gloves. Oh, I forgot to mention these. Yeah, if you go on the internet looking for modern gloves, you can get leather gloves in your length of choice. These are frankly excessive. I've worn these so many times. If you get the opportunity to buy a long leather pair of gloves. You should take that opportunity. Another thing that's very available is vintage gloves. Now, when I say vintage, that varies hugely. This, for example, is a pair of gloves from, I believe, the 60s. They have a lace back, an organza or net inside because they're black and they're a nice length and they're super decorative. I wear these a lot. Try and be gentle with them because they are old. Gloves are fresh fragile, I will damage them at a lot sometime, and I'm kind of okay with that. You need to decide if you're okay with that. Another good example of a pair of vintage gloves, opera gloves. So opera gloves, this is a 20th century pair. I bought them damaged, which is why I was like, heck yeah, wear them for LARP. One, opera gloves are long. They've got to come all the way up to your bicep, but also they have these cool buttons on the inside of the wrist. Chef's kiss, the best thing. Gloves with buttons. We love to see it. You can see there that they were very damaged when I got them and I should repair that, but such is the nature of gloves, you know? I've got so much fake blood on these. It's always washed out. They've been through hell after what I'm sure was very glamorous, probably the 90s. Going a little bit further back in time with vintage gloves, you get these guys. I've got a couple of pairs of these. I believe they are crochet, but I'm not ruling out a more esoteric craft. These guys are usually mid 20th century, so they can be as early as the 40s, they can be as late as the 60s. At least that's my understanding. They're fairly easy to find, they come up quite a lot. They're pretty robust by glove standards and they have a little bit of a stretch to them, which not all vintage gloves do. I quite like the effect that they give, but only for specific characters. They're not as broad an appeal, I think, as leather gloves or long opera gloves. Going even older than that, you find a lot of these guys. These are probably Edwardian kid leather opera gloves. When you find these for sale for not silly amounts of money, they have almost always been cut off, largely because people can't get their hands into them. Blame it on the arm section rather than the fact that you're supposed to use glove stretchers to get these on. I have found so many pairs of these over the years. Once they've been hacked off, they're not particularly worth saving. I'm still careful with them. Not gonna wear these to a, like a heavy fake blood game, right? Going to be a little bit respectful. I'm gonna try and keep them clean, but I do wear them. Broadly think that that's okay. I would rather they have some life because quite honestly, if I didn't wear them, like what would happen to them? They're just sit in a box no one would ever look at them because they're not good examples they're missing three quarters of the glove they're also tiny universally they are tiny the reason being is that you had to stretch them onto your hand the fact that these fit me is really weird if they come
them up and you get them and you're like, could I wear these for the LARP or should I keep them? Are they special? They're not that special. They are very old, but they're not that special. That is at least my personal opinion on that one. Costume gloves. Again, we are entering spooky season. So now is the time to start hunting through your local Halloween section for gloves. Examples of gloves that you get from the Halloween section. Lace gloves. Are they stupidly cheap and stretchy and will they fall apart relatively quickly? Yes. Do I mind? No, because LARP games are only a weekend long. From a distance, no one will tell the difference between your beautiful hand crocheted 1950s vintage gloves and a £2.50 pair of black lace Halloween gloves. They don't care, they just see that you're wearing interesting gloves. Equally, you do get modern opera gloves in the Halloween section, which have the advantage of being stretchy. These guys are fingerless, but you get the idea. Again, yes, they're cheap, they are spandex, kind of sweaty, you don't have the buttons, which are both nice and really annoying. And again, they're cheap, so you don't care if you get them covered in fake blood and ruined. But quite frankly, if it's good enough for Bridgerton, it's good enough for LARP. You're probably getting tired of me saying this by now, but are you a goth? or a steampunk or Lolita, raid your wardrobe. I have a bunch of different things. So these are from my like Victorian goth wardrobe. They are slightly pink now because I think that I have got them covered in fake blood one too many times. I promise fake blood is not as big a part of LARP as I make it seem. I very much enjoy it and it has an impact on your costume. <laughs> you often see this kind of thing pitched as like a Victorian style glove or a Victorian style lace Mitt, only Victorian in the minds of steampunks and goths, but let's run with it. Thanks to the emos, fishnet gloves are available in a wide variety of shapes, colours, lengths. Some might say these are not appropriate for fantasy costumes. I wear them. You're gonna get real bored of me taking this back to Lolita every single time, but hey, Lolita makes some great gloves. These guys for all my picnic at hanging rock fantasies. I have these guys, which are like leather gloves if you removed everything non-essential. They are extremely anime and I love them. The JRPG aesthetic is like an established part of fantasy now, so you'd be amazed what you can get away with. Also not exactly a glove, but Lolita has wrist cuffs. I bought these but you can make them. They're real easy. It's just some elastic and some lace and you can either wear them on their own or you can wear them with a shirt. And then the final category of gloves, of course, that you can tame is ones you make. Okay, so not gonna lie to you, sewing gloves is possible. I'm unclear on whether my friend made these or just like adjusted them. But either way, they're spectacular and I just wanted to show you how annoying these gloves are. Top tip, if you're thinking about putting bells on your costume, don't. You can sew your own gloves, but let's be honest, you or someone you know is probably knitting them. You have guys like this, which are normally called mitts. It's a tube with a hole for your thumb. Great, fine, exemplary, any color you want because you're making them. You can have slightly more complex mitts that have an actual light thumb and some shaping and some design. It's not necessary, but these are quite nice. If you're looking to get into knitting, especially like knitting in the round, these knit up real fast. Mitts or fingerless mitt is a great vein of knitting patterns. And you also, of course, you can knit gloves with fingers. I cannot be bothered, but you can do it. You also get mittens. So mittens, which we've not previously talked about, do not have fingers that are fully enclosed. Yes, I'm wearing two different mittens on two different hands to demonstrate. Fine motor detail is not going to be your friend, but boy are these warm. The mitten lifestyle is not for me, but if you have a problem with keeping your hands warm, these guys are so good. Two final points on gloves. One, do you lose your gloves? Time to treat yourself like a child. If you put a ribbon inside the sleeves of your coat, when you put whatever top you have on, there's a ribbon inside that goes across the back and down both your arms and comes out each sleeve by just like an inch or two. And then you safety pin the relevant glove or mitten to either end of that ribbon and you will no longer lose your gloves. That is what 
what we do with toddlers, yes. However, do you want to keep your gloves or not? Final point on gloves and possibly my biggest tip. If you have a pair of leather gloves, you can use a touchscreen, but also they're not the most insulating in the world. So your hands may still get cold, which is why you can put a pair of knitted mitts on top of your leather glove. Your hands and wrists are warm, but also you can use a touchscreen and have fine motor detail. I suppose it would work for any kind of thin glove. If you've got really thin gloves because you need to be able to do things in them, but then your hands are getting cold, fingerless mitts on top. So next we are on to the waist torso area and let's talk about belts. Belts and belt adjacent accessories. I think this section has ended up being because there's also a bunch of like sashes and harnesses that I've got in here. The short version is you should wear a belt and the reason why you should wear a belt is not only because it defines your waist and looks great, but because belt pouches exist and you need somewhere to put everything. I've got a couple of my belt pouches here. This one is more of like a hanging design. It's got a loop off the top. Surprisingly large real estate inside. I can fit my phone. Get a pouch that can fit, at least one that can fit your phone. If not everything fits into one pouch, get a second pouch. This one is a slightly different design. It's got a buckle down the front. Belt attachment is in line with the pouch itself. It's not going to flap about in quite the way that this thing will. Not that this one flaps around a lot. It really doesn't, but it's a consideration. Not to mention you can hang like your mug or any weapons you might have directly off your belt. You need a belt. You want to wear a belt. You in fact do not have to wear just one belt. You can wear multiples. That's cool. If you have a belt that is not like a super great fit on you. Got this from Prime. Mark. It has a really nice buckle and a, I think it's called a chafe, the end piece. This is a size small, but this is where the smallest hole is. That is where my waist fits. But if you have a belt that doesn't really fit you, that is a bit big, you can always wear it as like a bandolier type thing. You can still attach pouches to it. I actually have a bandolier. It's got a ring at one end, which I tend to thread my actual belt through. That just helps keep it in place. But it's a whole set of pouches. It is not as practical as you would imagine. The way these pouches close, are they're a little bit fiddly. I tend to have to like fight to get it. Open is okay, closed again is an effort. So the bandolier is not as practical as you might think it would be, but it is extremely cool. You have a lot of really practical belt options. You also have a lot of really interesting decorative belt options. Even if you're going for like a really basic belt, you can go for a thicker one like this. It evokes the sort of very thick belts worn in the like Burgundian, I think is the style I'm looking for. Late medieval, there was a trend for very, very thick belts. So I think a thick belt can end up looking quite good. Equally, you do occasionally find modern fashion belts that are double-ended. They have two buckles. I don't know that this is super historical. It looks really fantasy. It's it's a lot of extra interest. It does mean that you have slightly less space to put your belt pouches on. This is another fashion belt that I got that has an elasticated panel at the back. If you have trouble with belt sizing, you can get belts, belt like accessories with elastic in them. It's something you can look out for if you think it would make it more comfortable for you. This one is just a plated belt. It's very narrow. If you were looking for something like this, I think a braided or plated belt would be the keywords you wanted. You sometimes also get, so this belt is actually designed to be worn with the buckle in the back because it's decorative, which in of itself, you know, this is a cool belt. Have you considered that you don't actually have to wear your belt with the buckle in the front? It's more convenient. Convenience versus looking cool. You have a belt where you're not really happy with the style of the buckle. Shimmy it around so the buckles at the back. People won't look at it as much. If we're getting into the territory of like really purely decorative belts, this is going to be like the bells all over again. I actually do not know what this is. I was given it by a grandparent and it sits very low on the hips on me. So it is purely decorative. Doesn't really fit, but at the same time, this provides a lot of extra visual interest. And when I I do wear it, I usually wear it at an angle with an actual belt that I may or may not thread through it to make it sure that it does hang at an angle. A good belt alternative if you're not relying on it for heavy lifting is a sash. Here's a couple that I have. This is a narrow one. The pleats are fake. They're backed onto something. If you have some sort of pleated belt that you are making or buying, make the pleats fake. Putting them in every time is a pain. Don't 
do that. That's not a good idea. And this sash I think is just huge. Sash has a ruched decorative waist area that is fake. It is backed onto a regular piece of fabric and then it has big hanging tails. Now having said that sashes are more decorative, they can hold the waist of a garment in but they're not going to say support some belt pouches or whatever. But no one says you just have to wear a sash. You can wear a sash with a belt on top. You can wear a sash over your belt so that all your belt pouches and stuff are less obvious. You can wear as many sashes or belts as you want. Play around with it, get weird. It's fine, you'd be amazed how versatile these things are. This is an opinion that I think might get me banned from some LARPs, but let's talk harnesses. Harnesses can take a lot of different forms. Some of them are more like stretchy straps. Some of them are tied up. If you watched my Selkie skirt video, which according to the analytics, a lot of you did, I wore a harness in that reveal that was basically just some yarn and a bangle tied in interesting ways. So there's a bunch of different things you can get. I have quite a few like this, which surprise come from the Lolita wardrobe. This one has a nice lace up decorative front. It's not the real thing. It's stretchy and poppers in the back and it's got shoulder straps, which I have to have on the loosest possible setting because I'm tall. This guy has a decorative buckle finish at the front, but it actually closes with Velcro. It's again elasticated in the back and it's got shoulder straps. Then there's this confusing configuration of straps, which is perhaps a little closer to something I think people imagine they could make relatively easily. Or indeed this belt, which has just shoulder strap attached that goes diagonally a bit like a Sam Brown, which is the World War II English military belt, but you know, less directly military. Harnesses. If your costume is reading just a little bit too strictly medieval and you want to give it a bit more of a fantasy or in particular like a JRPG-esque fantasy feel, I think harnesses work really well. Kind of like coloured Doc Martens, they give a bit of an anachronistic punky flair to things. Quite a lot of the broad belt with shoulder strap ones that I've demonstrated, if your figure is a certain way, they focus a lot of attention on the centre of your chest, which may not be what you want. I find that you look like you've put a lot of thought into this outfit, when in reality you haven't, you've just done something that's less common. I really like them. I think there's a lot of ways to make them work really, really well. And they also, because they've got the shoulder straps and everything, serve as a really good place to attach stuff to. Speaking of attaching stuff, so we can argue that corsets are not accessories, they're actually items. And we can also argue that many LARPs will actually stop you from wearing corsets because they don't like it. I think people focus too much on this corset is my top and not enough on being able to use the structure of like an underbust or waist cincher corset as a basis for building things on. This is a very cheap mass produced underbust corset. If you just wear the corset, it's going to be like, oh, you put a corset on top of that dress. But maybe you put on the corset and then you put on a sash and a belt. You can put belts on top of corsets. Of course you can put belts on top of corsets. You might have to make your belt smaller, but you can put belts on top of corsets and then you maybe put a bandolier on and maybe you hitch one of your skirts up underneath the corset and all of a sudden it's no longer, oh, you're wearing a corset. You've got an interestingly layered costume that's using the stability of a fairly rigid bone structure, both to keep that weight distributed around your body and stop things from digging into you, but also to hold out all of your accessories around your torso in an interesting and flattering way. Basically, make corsets work for you. Final thing which I'm gonna just touch on which I think you would not easily find unless you were also into Lolita. This is a, I think it was described as a tail, a sheer veil overskirt. It only goes at the back and hangs down in sort of this lovely floaty diaphanous fabric and it's got these big swags of net next to it and the whole thing attaches to a dress by little elastic loops and they attach onto clear buttons sewn onto the dress 
dress partially hidden by trim. Do not underestimate how much heavy lifting an artfully draped or gathered piece of see-through fabric can do. In particular, if you just want a little bit of a train, some extra swoosh, and you don't necessarily want to use it all the time. One, the attaching stuff with little loops of elastic and see-through buttons, genius. Honestly, if you want to make any part of your costume detachable, that's amazing. But the gathered fabric train slash trail, really impactful, incredibly simple. You're gonna have to make it, but it's gonna be a rectangle and two loops of elastic. You can make that. I believe in you, you can do it. What do you talk about for like the neck area if you're not doing scarves? Let's talk about fur. Why do you wanna add fur to your costume? Easy, fur looks great. It looks luxurious, it looks expensive, it looks bougie. It's also really freaking warm. You would be amazed how warm even fake fur will make you. Big thing we need to deal with first, there are two kinds of fur. There are real fur, which is the skin of animals, and there is fake fur, which is plastic. Neither of these is an amazing choice from an environmental and sustainability perspective, so I'm just going to say buy second hand. Let's have a look at what we've got here. So the smallest kind of accessory you're going to find is the fur collar. This one is fake fur. Not all fake furs are created equal. You're going to find some fake fur that is extremely cheap and some fake fur that looks really, really good. I find even the cheap fake fur doesn't look as bad as people make it out to be, especially not when you use lots of it. The little fake fur collar may or may not attach to your costume. This one's got a ribbon, so you can wear it separately if you want. This one came off a coat, so it's got big loops for attaching to buttons on the coat itself. This is mohair. So mohair can be harvested off the goat. I think it's a goat. I should know this. That's like firmly in my wheelhouse. It can be shorn off the animal. I think this is attached to skin, so the animal died. But if that's the kind of look you want, you can get mohair wefts, which is the shorn mohair sewn into wefts like you get on a wig and you can make stuff out of it. And then finally, this one is real. I don't know what kind of animal because I'm not an expert in that, but this is a vintage fur collar that I got at, where did I get this? Charity shop, car boot sale, can't remember. So you have the small collar shape, then you have what I like to call the scarf. All mine of these are fake fur, so I've got this grey one, I've got this black one, and then this hideous one that I actually just made. It's raw on the back, no one cares, no one noticed, they just noticed that it was extravagant. <laughs> this is kind of what I mean when I say people from a distance, no one can tell that your fur is cheap, especially not if you have a lot of it. I really like these scarfy boys because they often have a loop on the back. I think this one has an actual like slit in the scarf and it's so that you can loop them through. That is going to mess up my mic so much. You can wear it as like a self-contained thing. Then we have the weird category. Let's talk about tippets. So a tippet is a long thin thing and in vintage fashion they often tend to be fur and worn around the shoulder area. So this ungodly creation, which look away now if you are uncomfortable seeing dead animals' faces and paws. I don't know what to tell you, vintage fur is a whole thing. Vintage fur tippets, I find, tend to be quite realistic. I don't know why. Again, this came out of a charity shop, I think, and it was one of those things that I don't feel good about owning this, but I do own it, so I'm gonna keep wearing it because these animals died and it would be kind of tragic to let this just rot in a cupboard somewhere. I do not advocate buying this stuff new. If you are absolutely certain that it is vintage, don't let them go to waste. I feel like we've been over the fur argument lots and lots of times. We'll move on. I will say that from a lot perspective, turning up as a character wearing what are very obviously dead animals sets a tone. And sometimes you want that. And then finally what you have are the wraps. Now again, this, this one is real. This is vintage, I think 1960s based on the hat that it came with. It has a little clippy button. I'm not gonna lie, I've had this for 
20 years. Fur wears well. Don't be worried about getting vintage furs thinking that they're all horrible and gonna fall apart. She's doing just fine. And then this fur wrap is synthetic and very long and I think was kind of intended to be more of that kind of an affair. You know, if you feel, want to feel like a movie star. Out of all of these, if you're looking for primarily warmth, I would go for the scarfy type thing. If you are looking for maximum drama, the tippet is a time. The wrap is both warmer than the tippet. I find not as warm as the scarfy thing because it's not pressed around your neck, it's just kind of around your shoulders. But because you can adjust it, you have a little bit more control over the warmth side of things. The wrap is, you have to be aware of it. It's not going to stay on its own. And if you just want the little nod to the fur, a collar is great. It's detachable. It's just going to keep this part of your neck warm. It's not very bulky. They're usually not very expensive. I will briefly touch on how do you tell if it's fake fur or real fur when you're in, say, a charity shop and it's not labelled? Fake fur, if you part it right the way down, you can normally see a weave or a knit pattern. It looks like fabric. Or sometimes you just get this crimpy fuzz as they've tried to cover that up. It also tends to be longer pile and it tends to be more unusual colours. Real fur, one, the fur will differ in quality quality across the piece, especially on a bigger piece of fur. So you can see that this fur here looks very soft. It's sort of bunching together because that's belly fur. And this fur here looks different and it feels more coarse because it's got guard hairs in it because this is the back fur. You normally can't see a weave when you part the real fur all the way down, but you'll be aware that there's sort of two layers to the fur. There's an outer guard hair and then the inner downy fluffy insulating fur that makes it really difficult to see down to the skin. Sometimes you can, and you can actually see that it's like a leather. And also if you look at any seams, you can sometimes see that it is skin and not a woven fabric around the edges. After the neck we have the face, and well there's a few things you can put on your face, but primarily I'm going to be talking about masks. So it's pretty much only two ways to get masks. One, the Halloween section, and two, make them yourself. What's available in the Halloween section can range from Comment down below if you remember that video. To, you know, this is again just a Halloween store. I am an idiot. This is just a regular Halloween store mask and I think it looks really good. I have been secretly searching for a character I could wear this for for a while now. Sometimes it's a case of just hunting through the Halloween section until you find something that's quite good. Sometimes it's a case of searching through the Halloween section until you find something that is utterly terrifying. Comment if you remember that video. Then you have the stuff that you can find in like the theatrical supplies, which is only just a step up from the Halloween stuff. This one is actually so uncomfortable that I opted for the character I used it for to not wear it on my face, but instead either round my neck or on a hat band. This smaller style is called a half mask or a domino, if you're looking out for that. Domino often tends to be just around the eyes as well, but I certainly something like this would generally be called a half mask, whereas something covering the full face is a full mask. The main other way that you're going to get masks for costumes is to make it yourself, and the easiest way of doing that is to buy a pre-made mask blank and customize it. This is one that I didn't make, but someone I know did for a LARP, and at the end they were like, we're never using all of these masks again. Please take one if you would like one. This one I did pay paint myself very, very quickly. So this was done quite simply. I intended to add a lot more detail to it, but it was fine as it was. It wasn't the main focus of the costume. And that was just made from one of these mask blanks that come from Hobbycraft. They're not difficult to find. They're not expensive. They're not going to survive very long, especially not in, you know, a field. This one's been worn to one very civilized event and then just stored and it's already not in the best shape. But that's okay, you know? Masks, I feel, are one of those accessories that's a little bit fungible and it's just going to break one day. You hope that it's long enough that you get to finish wearing it. But the sky is really the limit with making masks. You can start from one of these
these blanks and they are just card so you, if you want to chop bits off you can if you want to add to it if you want to build it up with papier-mâché paint them carve them cover them in clay you're imaginative people I'm sure you can think of way more things than I can I'm allowed to put my glasses back on now and finally we reach the top of the head hats and headdresses so I had to make an arbitrary distinction between what is you know hair styling and what is hats so if you don't see anything in this section wait for the video about makeup and hair styling hats can be a problem because a lot of people will pick up kind of generic hats that they find at a charity shop and not really think about the fact that a lot of those hats are super modern one of my personal favorites this is actually a fedora not a pretend fedora i love this hat i wear it for a lot of things but it is solidly 20th century and onwards you can't even really pass this off as victorian it's also a little little small for me y yes of course i own a deer stalker victorian not any earlier sad times likewise fur hats people want fur hats for playing you know vikings and stuff but the fur hats that you find are often like this and now i can't hear in my own voice because i've tucked my ears in i can just hear crinkling again i love this hat i probably look really terrible in it it's very 1960s so what kind of hats are good regardless of whether or not it's in character if it is hot you want a sun hat i've tried repeatedly to get the sun hat to stick out instead of folding no such luck could i maybe make this better by adding like a brooch and some flowers or some feathers or something something to make it look more of the period that i was trying to recreate yes will it do also yes it keeps the sun out of my eyes and that is all that we want from this hat other than to possibly stop folding down all the time sun hat not terribly in character very important the piece de resistance the chef's kiss the hat that secretly you all want you want to go on amazon or ebay or your chinese reseller of choice and search for floppy felt hat and the hats you get are very like this sun hat but felt they have a domed top and a circular brim and they're a bit floppy but not super floppy and you can do all kinds of things with those exhibit a i present to you my faux musketeers hat i remember this fitting better i made this for a specific character i literally just sewed up stabbed the needle through a couple of times to hold this up and i glued in these plumes fun fact if your ostrich plumes are not behaving and looking plumy enough they're a bit too like frizzled everywhere a curling iron straighteners feathers are made of keratin they're the same as hair you can style them like hair maybe i'll do a video on styling ostrich plumes i'm not very good at it but i know like the basics i understand the principle but that's how you end up with well-behaved ostrich feathers also this is like six or seven feathers stacked on top of each other again if you're like my ostrich feather doesn't look full enough it's because it's only one and when you get plumes on hats it's normally like five or six hats are expensive i actually bought this hat i didn't make it but it's the same principle it's the same base hat as the one I made but this one's obviously a very fetching pirate tricorn there are some hats you cannot make from starting with the floppy felt hat base but not many certainly not for LARP so if you want a hat they do claim to be 65% cotton so final point on the hat hats look we all know that we have no good reason to be wearing these and we all know we're going to anyway so these kind of mass-produced cutesy cottage call witch hats or gnome hats or fairy hats whatever you get them sold as are here to stay larpers will just wear these now myself included and we just all need to accept that in our hearts i obviously could not make a hat or headdress video without talking about the most ubiquitous piece of headwear in all of larp the flower crown there are a million and one flower crown tutorials out there you can also buy them everywhere from amazon to claire's to specific party shops what can I say? It's a flower crown or a flower wreath or a flower headdress. If you search for any of those things, you will find one. They come in a variety of colors, styles. You pick what's gonna fit with your costume. And if anyone gives you crap for wearing a flower crown, screw that person. Clearly they're no fun. This is veering into the hairstyling side of things. I'm gonna mention it just because it's too good a tip not to. Just 
just a really simple fabric colored headband. And you'll be like, that's really modern and obvious. Yes, it is, but it's also the perfect base to build stuff off of if you're not super comfortable with anchoring stuff directly into your hair. Or if like me, you don't have a lot of hair to anchor to. I bought a multi-pack of these. I've got like 40 in a variety of colors. I just grabbed a random selection to show you. So no matter what outfit I'm putting together, I will always have a headband that's in vaguely the right color that I can put on. And then I can pin my veil to it. I can put flowers on it. I can attach decorations to it. I can decide that actually I'm gonna hot glue a crown to it, a circlet. There are many options. And these are so cheap, so easily available and come in so many colors. If you do a lot of head stuff, they're good to have around. On a similar note, are you tired of me bringing in Lolita accessories yet? So this is a headband that's just been covered with lace. Oh, I forgot I shouldn't do this with glasses on. So I will admit this is one of the most annoying things in the world, but also look at it. Do not underestimate one, how uncomfortable it is to have things hanging down in front of your eyes, but also like how dramatic that looks. And it's a really good example of how much stuff you can anchor off just a headpiece. I mean, if I really wanted to, no, ow, I could do it the other way around. It's not as good because it's not long enough, but if the chains were longer and I was wearing a wig, that would look really cool and like elven. So if you want to start pinning your necklaces to your hairbands, wearing them that way. Another really important piece of headwear that we can't overlook is the veil. There's a lot of like medieval veil tutorials out there that will tell you how to properly wear a veil. At LARP, wig clips, because quite frankly, I love wearing bands and pinned on veils and that, but also I can just, this is just in now. It's not going anywhere. Lightweight hair accessories, veils, hoods that you definitely want to keep up, wig clips. I guess that is pretty much everything that you can put on your head. No, don't, don't leave, don't, you like the Two final categories of accessories to cover, and one of them is extremely practical, and that is bags. You need a bag. There's kind of no if, buts, or maybes here. You need somewhere to put your stuff. You should have a bag. Ideally, that bag should fit your character. You have a lot of options. We've already covered belt pouches. Belt pouches are great. They are not big enough for everything. Although, trust me, I'm trying. You can have a satchel. This one came from Primark and I used it as my main handbag for a long time until it fell apart and then I got an actual nice satchel. Not only has this held up surprisingly well, I've worn it to a lot of LARP games because it looks kind of generically in character. This is not leather, but it seems like it might be leather. It's got a nice like tooled front, but most importantly, I can flip with one hand and get into whatever I want. And it has a zippered pocket, which having an internal zippered pocket, surprisingly useful for a place to put stuff that is not your character's, it's yours, like your phone and your keys and your wallet, because depending on the game, people might be rummaging through your stuff and you want to distinguish between your character's stuff that they can half inch and your stuff, which they can't because that's a crime. This is another example of a satchel, although this one I actually made from a tote bag. So a tote bag is where you have two straps and you normally wear it over one shoulder. Tote bags are deeply impractical for LARP. They require constant maintenance to stay where they are. Satchels kind of don't. But I really liked the embroidery detail on this. I thought it was really cool. So I converted this into a satchel by undoing one side of each strap and fastening them together. It actually tied in a knot because the strap was too long when I did that. But I'm going to figure that out at some point. Backpacks are an option. The problem is, is if you want to get something out of your backpack, you have to take it off or sling it around to the front, and put it back again. It's depending on how much costume stuff you've got going on. Big sleeves, long hair, horns, that can get awkward. In general, I think if you're going to have a bag above and beyond your belt pouches, satchel is the way to go. But that's a personal opinion. If you have other options and opinions, please let me know. I'm always open to new things. And if you're going to say, a sack, I see you, then I respect your choices, but uh, it's just not for me. The final category of accessories we're going to talk about is not one to go ham on, okay? You want to limit yourself to 
one, maybe two, and maybe not all the time. Don't feel you have to have one of these, but it is something you hold. Now, sometimes that can be something that you can hold, but can also like attach to your belt or something, like my lightsaber. It does actually. Yes, it's the cheapest toy I get in time for that one video. I feel like a lot of this video is just me going, hey, do you remember that one? I've done other stuff, I'm relevant. So this is a great example of a prop that you can sometimes hold or you can also like stow somewhere. Another kind of weapon is also available. I just haven't got, my LARP weapons are over there and I'm lazy. But most of these are things that you're going to be holding in your hand most, if not all of the time. It has to be something light because you're gonna carry it. It has to be something very significant because you're taking up one or both of your hands to deal with it. And it also has to be something that if you put it down somewhere and walk away, it's not super breakable because LARPs are chaos. A couple of really great examples of accessories you can hold is our pet. I've seen people bring puppets. I've seen people bring stuffed animals. Edgar here is just, you know, hanging out and I can interact with him. I can pretend to stroke him. I can move him around like he's paying attention. I can cradle him in my arms like a baby because he's baby. It fits with your character, the pet prop or familiar or whatever, you probably shouldn't call Edgar here a pet. It can be a great way to both convey your character and also like give other people an in to talking to your character because they can be like, oh, who's the bird? Why do you have a bird? Why are you talking to your bird? You get the idea. Another really great example of an accessory that you can carry that will not make you hate yourself is a light source, but it doesn't have to be a very like serious light source. As you can see, this is a deeply impractical light source. It's not actually going to help. I find because LARPs often happen, a significant part of LARP often happens after dark. A sort of thematic light source is a really cool prop and they don't have to be super expensive. So I've got a, I couldn't find it, I've got a solar lantern that's meant for camping but it looks kind of interesting. I've got this which is a Halloween bird cage from the pound shop and two different sets of fairy lights from various Halloween collections. They're just battery powered, that's like no effort at all to keep it maintained. A light Light source as well gives you a lot of opportunities. You can hold it out or bring things closer to it, bring it closer to things or people, hold it over people's shoulders, brandish it at monsters. Why do you think I own a candelabra? Again, gateway to more role play. Above and beyond weaponry, there is of course the good old, it's not LARP safe, so you're not allowed to hit anyone with it, but it technically functions like a weapon. This is my magical girl staff, which is made out of piece of garden stuff stake with metal down the middle. It's not heavy, but it is not something I would want to hit someone with. And yet, I have 100% played games where I wandered around holding something in my hands, holding it in different ways, leaning on it, gently booping people with it. Depends what your character does. The staff, the walking stick, show you my hand painted. Again, that's from a video, video most of you have never seen. But really when it comes to unconventional accessories, like the sky's the limit, this is a thing that I own. A really good friend of mine, Jenny from Jed Badger Designs, made these for a game in which she arrested me. They were just a Halloween decor item, repainted and weathered them and then added the twine so that when the links jiggled around, it seemed like they should clink, but they don't because they're obviously plastic. And I was, just manacled for a bit. It was, uh, people had a good time. Anytime you see something in the Halloween section, the costume section, a weird object in a charity shop, and it's light enough to carry, too heavy or too large to maybe put on your head, consider carrying it around as a prop. Maybe it's a teacup and saucer. Maybe it's, you know, think about Grogu from the Mandalorian with his little bowl, or Gandalf's staff. Oh heck, I've got the moonlight. I could have brought you the moon, I'm gonna bring you the moonlight. 
all this moonlight, which not charged up right now, but to be honest, even if you had like a plastic crystal ball or something and you wanted to carry it around, there's endless opportunities. So what next? As it turns out, I have a whole bunch more videos to make now because I couldn't fit all of the accessories into one. Turns out I just have way too much to talk about. <laughs> if you'd like to see future videos about jewelry, scarves, or makeup and hairstyling and how you can use that to make costumes more interesting, more authentic, and more characterful, subscribe. Meanwhile, if you've missed some videos and you want to learn about how to shop your own wardrobe or a charity shop to put together a fantasy costume for a LARP, a RAN fair, another event that I haven't imagined, a birthday party, please go and watch some of my other videos. This is like the fifth video in this series now. There's a whole bunch of videos. And if you're wandering around going, hey, I have no idea what this LARP thing you keep referencing is, but it sounds like it might be interesting. I've got a whole video on that too. Don't forget to like and leave a comment to make the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram if you'd like to make my cat happy and also see really dumb reels that I make because I'm not allowed on TikTok. And finally, in the description box, you'll find a link to my Kofi page where you can make a one-off or reoccurring financial donation to support this channel and make me very happy. People who donate get early access to my videos. So if you want to see content like this 24 hours earlier than everyone else, you can do that for as little as three pounds. Thank you so much for watching, dream big, and I'll see you next time. It does help if I actually turn that on before doing the, the bing bings. I did actually press record on that, didn't I? First things first, what do you do if no one can see your socks? Oh dear. I feel really bad. I was mad that the uh, doorbell went off, but it was Thursday's food. We do need to feed the cat. <laughs> Ah, oh, okay, where was I? Socks. The final category of accessories, finally, God. Like my lightsaber. I'm gonna show Edgar to the close-up camera. Boop, boop, boop. What a good boy. That's apparently where your center of balance is. Dimensionality. I think I'm just gonna do yeah, f it, we took six minutes. I'm going to do my outro. So there we are, a not exhaustive